Hello, everyone, and welcome this Thursday to an office hour webinar on ESG CV reporting. My name is Tommy Joe Bednar, and I work for Apt Associates. I'm going to be covering a few housekeeping and logistical pieces of information before we get into the meat of today's webinar. First and foremost, I want to remind you that we want to all to be able to hear us today, and we want to have the opportunity to make sure that we're communicating with you and also can hear you when we have time for questions. So if you're having difficulty with your computer audio, if it sounds choppy, or if you just prefer to connect via phone, um, please connect with the phone number on the screen here and the access code. I've also added that information to the chat box on the right-hand side of your screen. Um, so usually that audio is much better if you have the opportunity to call in today. A note that we will also be recording today's session, and that recording along with the slides and materials from today will be available on the HUD Exchange in about three business days after this session. We do want you to interact and ask questions today. This is an office hour. It's meant to have a lot of questions. Um, and we want to, you to have the opportunity to ask those questions verbally, if you're able to and want to. Um, to do so, please use the raise hand icon on the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. It's going to look ever so slightly different from this screenshot here because of an update we had. But if you open the panel on the right-hand side of your screen, you'll see a little hand there. Go ahead and click that, and that'll raise your hand within WebEx, and it'll let us know that you have a question so that we can unmute you and you can ask that question verbally. We'll call on you to let you know. And when you're done with that, go ahead and lower your hand. To be able to, answer, to, be able to ask and have your questions answered verbally um, out loud, please make sure that you connect your computer to the audio option. Everyone's allowed to have audio connections now. You just gotta make sure that you connect it to a phone or to a microphone. And finally, if you don't feel comfortable asking your questions verbally um, or you have other questions that you want to add or have follow-ups on in the chat box, we encourage you to use the chat feature. Again, it's going to look ever so slightly different from this screenshot here. Um, please just make sure that you send those chat questions to everyone. That way all of our panelists and your fellow participants can see those questions. With that, I want to note that today's presenters for our ESG CV reporting office hours session are William Snow from HUD, the Office of Special Needs Assistance Program, Michelle Budzik from the Partnership Center, Meredith Alsa from the Partnership Center, and some technical and WebEx assistance from Apt Associates and the Partnership Center as well. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and hand our session over to William Snow. Okay. Thanks, Tommy Joe. Looking forward to today's session and today's office hours. A reminder to folks that this is an ESG CB quarterly reporting office hours. We will not be handling questions outside of the quarterly reporting. Um, if you ask them and I happen to know the answer or somebody on the call happens to know the answer, we will attempt to answer that, but uh, do not be surprised if we send you to the AAQ. Uh, there are a lot of great questions out there, several of which are not answered. Uh, because they need to be discussed with leadership and with our, um, our council. So just, just be patient with us, but recognize we will not attempt to answer every single uh, question that's associated with re our other requirements in reporting. Uh, I want to jump in and just do a quick reminder on something we talked about regularly, and that's who's who. I'll try to do this a little faster for us. Um, again, this is the key. So we want you to know who's got to do what. So, recipient. Recipient gets the money. Recipient is going to be the first player when it comes to the reporting requirements. You control everything. Right? You kick it off. You go into stage. You log in. You start off the reporting um, by creating bundles. Those bundles are the things that shape all the data that comes to you, at least with regard to client-level data. So. It's really, really important that you know that you, are, as the recipient, are the one who does that work. You got to know what projects to be bundled by what project type and which HMIS they're going into. Uh, you as states have this a little bit harder. Some of you have 10 or 15 COCs you're working with, and that may be 10 or 15 different HMIS implementations. So in each of those implementations where there is a project with ESGCB funding from the state, 
you're going to have to send a unique bundle with all the projects via that specific component type to that HMIS lead. So again, I don't envy you. Uh, that's that's messy, um, but that's uh, that's the process that we're doing the quarterly reporting by. And again, it, um, this is one where communication is key. So we can't stress enough uh, communicating with your HMIS leads, talking to them beforehand. There's nothing to say that when you're setting up the bundles, you can't talk to your HMIS leads. I were you, as I'm setting up my bundles, I would probably call my lead one lead at a time and say, look. I think you have project A, B, and C. Can you just verify with me right now, just over the phone? That way I know when I do this the first time, it's right. Uh, and you would go through that with each uh, HMIS lead. That's, that's just a recommendation. You can, you can um, administer this any way you want in terms of setting up your reporting, but the bundles are pretty, pretty important. Uh, the subrecipients you have, they're gonna be doing business as normal in terms of data collection but they will not be involved in the reporting process after that. So they just gotta make sure they get their data collection correct. Uh, the exception is victim service providers. They will be acting as they would under normal ESG funding scenarios, right? They still have to collect the data. They still uh, have to do an ESG CV export for SAGE. And so they more or less have the same work that they normally do, except uh, we get to do it quarterly. Uh, HMIS lead staff, so the key here, again, goes back to the bundles. HMIS lead staff will aggregate data or bundle the data in HMIS based on how the bundles are set up. So if there's something wrong with the bundles, they'll have a couple days to look at that and say, hmm, there's something wrong with the bundle. It doesn't look like it has the right projects or it has too many projects. Uh, they'll get a chance to kind of shoot that back to you as a recipient if there's an error. But if there's not, they're just gonna run the caper uh, from their HMIS, but they're gonna aggregate all the projects in the bundle to run that. So again, HMIS leads are new actors. I tell you that we've said it before, and I wanna say it again, if you haven't considered putting funding towards your HMIS lead, uh, this is new time, new money. This is going to not be free for them. Um, so I strongly encourage you to think about what costs may be required for them to train new users, for them to run the data uh, that's eligible under ESG. Um, so definitely consider what costs may need to be uh, provided to the HMIS leads to get this done. Finally, the recipients. You are the last player, you, so you're first and last. You set things up and you verify that everything is uh, reported correctly from in terms of the client level data, the, the files are set up correctly from the CSVs. Just verify that the data looks right and then you're gonna to have to fill out any remaining forms, right? That's expenditure forms, that's forms for any unique costs you incurred under the uh, CARES Act or for the ESG CV notice. So all of those are, that's a quick run through of the roles. We're always happy to go through that more. Again, this is one of those things we don't expect you to have that right off the top of uh, your head there and we want to help you understand that. It's really, really important. I'm gonna make one more note before we uh, move on and that is uh, we have been talking internally about the temporary emergency shelter element. Uh, we know that that's really important. We've been talking about documentation. Uh, it will take a little while, but we will put information about documentation out. I think you probably know that. Uh, we've been talking specifically about the issue of the role of the public health authority and what it means to document their role in the process. So more to come on that one, um, but that's obviously pretty important and we'll, we'll do our best to get you something that you can work with. All right, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Michelle. Thank you, William. We're um, hoping that you as, especially as states, have opened up your um, SAGE dashboard, have found your ESG CV program, and have clicked that launch pad to start the reporting. Um, we were um, really afraid the other day when we uh, looked and there were only 15 ESG recipients across the country who had started. If you haven't started, and, and you're a large state, this is gonna take you some time. And so one of the reasons that we've opened it up so early is that you have the time to um, 
you know, sit there and look at it before you actually have to set out the bundle. So if you could um, start it, that would be great. If you um, haven't signed a grant agreement with HUD, you can go ahead and um, and do that that setup that says you haven't signed the grant agreement yet um, and submit it. You don't have to wait till the 1st or the 30th. You can submit it and get it out of the way. That will open up the next um, launch pad for you where you can be working way in advance of when the reporting is due. So um, we're just encouraging you to do that as as quickly as you can or as efficiently as you can. Um, we have, um, after talking to the HMIS leads and talking to some of you, um, HUD has changed the time that the HMIS leads and victim service providers have to review their bundles. So at first it was 24 hours, um, and we have now increased that to three days. So and. And the HYS leads have asked us to be really specific about what exactly three days equals and how we count that and when it starts. And um, so we're being very liberal here. Um, the email is sent one day. The next day is day one, day two, day three. So you send the, the, you send the bundle email on Monday. Um, day one is Tuesday, then Wednesday then Thursday. On Thursday night at midnight, we lock the um, submission and everybody has to submit. Until that day, they cannot submit. And that allows you to, if we have to pull it all back or pull one of them or a couple of them back because the bundles are wrong, that allows us the time to kind of pull it back before people start reporting and all of a sudden we have this mess. So. We're asking the HMIS leads very strongly to review their bundles within that uh, 24 hours. If you are uh, an eager beaver and you have actually sent your bundles now um, before the end of, of the initial period, before September 30th, um, they won't lock until midnight of the third day of that reporting month. So they won't lock until midnight on October 3rd. Um, and you have all that time then to make any corrections. Um, and we're going to go to questions and answers because I believe strongly that especially from the states, if you've thought about this, you have bunches of questions. So Meredith, you want to start us off? Yeah, sure thing. We have a couple that have come in. So we have one where there is a um, – one of their subrecipients had a sub subrecipient that they funded for a short period of time but are no longer funding. The amount was small. It would have cost more for the HMIS setup fees, training, staff times, et cetera, than they were given. Uh, they submitted the demographic information using an older report template from recipients that were allowed to use the one-time upload for the CAPER. Is there any way to include this data? Can they send an AAQ in and tell us specifically what they funded and the dates of when they funded it? There may be another option for you. So I, I actually posted that in the response, if you'll see later in the chat. Uh, so Juliana, look further down there in the response. It's there's, uh, what I call a free pass, still to be notice or anything before June 30th, 2020. Uh, that was built into the notice with the understanding that it takes time to get things up and moving. And so uh, there is a 60-day period where you do not have to have collected the data. That period is only or only applied to that January 21st through June 30th period uh, and not beyond that. So if you started June 1st, uh, you don't get 60 days from June 1st. So actually, every, all of that allowance ends June 30th. So if that project was operating in, during that period, you actually you don't have to do anything uh, in terms of uploading client-level data. You're going to have to tell us what you did in, in the narrative and whatnot, but not in the client-level data. Uh, if it falls outside that period, this happened after June 30th, you don't have a free pass. Uh, there are some options that we'd like to explore in this where an AAQ could be very helpful uh, because 
you have to you have funding available as at least an eligible cost in terms of HMIS. You may have to do some work to get that data entered, or we may have to think about other solutions. Um, but know that there are a couple options, and uh, and start by looking at the date that that was operating. Thank you. Uh, current ESG funded shelters receiving additional ESG CV funds for motel vouchers um, for among, uh, among other emergency shelter funding. Do these additional motel voucher funds require a separate motel voucher project in HMIS? And if so, is it considered a temporary emergency shelter? So this is one where uh, it actually depends a little bit on the scenario. So uh, several shelters brought in motel, hotel motel vouchers so that they could expand their space for the existing shelter. So let's just say that they had, were serving 50 households. They are now using hotel motel vouchers, and they're still serving 50 households, but they did that so that they could spread out the people uh, that they're serving to be in line with CDC guidance. In that case, you're just doing normal ESG data collection for that single project. We are not making you do anything new for that. However, if this is a new set of units, this is an additional 50, new set of 50, uh, it depends. You have a little bit of flexibility because you could set it up under temporary emergency shelter uh, because you're using hotel motel vouchers. That is a new way to do it. You also actually uh, we would allow you to report this under your normal ESG shelter as well. Uh, so you have some option there, whatever is here, that's our perspective. Is whatever is here on that one, uh, you can choose. Just be ready for that ESG TV piece uh, to report on all of them, right? If, it, if you're using it as an expanded shelter, you'll report on all of them, which I think that you're prepared to do that, and that's logical. Michelle, any other setup or, or Meredith setup things that we should th think through on that one? No, we actually put out setup guidance very early on in um, in this work, and the setup guidance was around those kinds of things and 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 how to use emergency shelter. And the guidance actually works exactly the way William just said it. So, um, without having a notice. On that one, we called it right, and um, the setup guidance is correct there. And I just posted a link to that guidance. Um, I know uh, Christina said that they had an audio issue. I did too, so we didn't hear all of what William said, but everything William said is in that document I just linked to. So you can also uh, go check that out um, for more information. Okay, um, just confirming, if we haven't had any client costs in this reporting period, we don't need to set up the bundles for this period, do we? Right, actually let's walk through this for a little bit on timing. Uh, there are a couple scenarios here. So, scenario one, you were awarded money as a recipient. You do not have an executed grant agreement. What do you do? Uh, nothing. You don't have an executed grant agreement. You're not reporting on anything. You don't have anything to report on. Scenario two, you have your award. You have an executed grant agreement. You have not spent a dime yet. What are you going to do? You actually will have to go into SAGE uh, because you do have an executed grant agreement. However, you will have a chance to indicate on the screen that you have the executed grant agreement, but you haven't served anybody uh, and you haven't incurred costs. At that point, you will skip any bundling. You don't have to do any of that, but you will put all zeros in your financial form. We just need you to, to do that. It's a simple process. You can do that today. If you're sure you're not going to spend a dime before uh, next Tuesday or whenever October 1st hits, you can do this October reporting right now. So that's a good thing. You have another scenario, scenario three, where you may have – so you have an executed grant agreement. You've incurred costs, let's say HMIS costs because you've done some training or you've done other training, but you haven't served any clients yet. Uh, so you haven't done rapid rehousing. You haven't done any emergency shelter. In that case, you will not have to bundle either because there's no client to report on. 
Uh, you will report on your expenditures, and I do want to put a fine point on that. The ESG CV quarterly reporting is all about expenditures. So if you've expended money, even if you haven't reimbursed for anything, even if you're the sub and you've sought reimbursement and the recipient hasn't reimbursed, or where the recipient has sought reimbursement from HUD and it hasn't happened yet, we don't care about any of that for the purposes of reporting. We only care about expenditures, which puts a little more work on you guys on the recipient side. Please make sure you're talking to us. Uh, you're going to have to report on that. Uh, the last scenario is people, you have an executed grant agreement, you serve people. People is as few as one. You serve one person with ESG CV funds, you will be doing uh, a CSV file on that. And so you should expect to do the full report. So those are a couple scenarios that we know are coming, but we did, we just wanted to highlight some of you will have nothing to do because you don't have an executed grant agreement. You have nothing to worry about. Um, and some of you really aren't going to have any expenditures. So you can move forward now and get that thing out of the way. And if I could just do a, a little follow-up, because I think it, it, it often takes me a minute or two to think this through with expenditures. When William is talking about you haven't expended money, he means your projects haven't expended money. He doesn't mean you, the recipient, haven't paid a check yet. He means that the project, so if you funded shelters and they provided service and they haven't billed you, that's a problem. You've got to get them to bill you or you've got to at least get them to send you something that says what they've expended so you can report on that and then those are going to be bundles. So it doesn't mean, expended does not mean you spent it, it means your recipient spent it and you don't have to have drawn it to report it. So it's a whole different way of thinking about this for you and um, just so just so we're clear. Okay, next up, um, and it, we may want to switch over to Sage here. Uh, this person says, as a recipient, I've been to the dashboard, but I don't see where to enter sub-recipient information to create bundles. Does that come up after I answer the initial questions about the grant agreement and expenditures? It does. So you've answered these grant agreements and expenditure questions, and then the rest of the report will show up. Um, if you answer in this one no to you did not um, have a grant agreement or you have not made any expenditures, those forms for bundles or the HMIS leads will never show up. Um, and some people have said to me they want to they haven't. Uh, they don't have a grant agreement, but they but they want to be entering their HMIS leads and getting this all together. That's really cool. If you won't have a grant agreement by September 30th, click yes and submit the form to HUD. Then your next one will open, and you can work on that one. We have a question about determining the start date for shelters. So this is uh, referencing back to how you explained it in the past. They are still confused um, by how the start date is determined. So could we do a quick review and explain the purpose of setting the start date? Okay. I assume you can see my the PowerPoint yep. again. Yep. So the reporting start date is really in order to help you figure out what what people in shelters and street outreach are going to be reporting. And it starts the whole process for your reporting. We worry about shelters and street outreach and not about RRH or homeless prevention because those homeless prevention and RRH are to be in their own projects in the HMIS that just started up with ESGCV. So we don't have to worry about them because if you pull data on them today and there's no clients on them, there's nothing going to come in the report. The problem with the reporting start date is that you're reporting on shelters. And for, for shelters and street outreach projects, 
those were there for the most part before the pro before the COVID, and they're going to be there after the COVID. And so, and those projects never stop in HMIS, and they never identify which people in the shelter were served with ESGCV money. So the rules on shelter and street outreach are: if you served one person in that time period, then everybody gets reported. So what we're trying to do is not show a gross overcount and have you start too early. Um, and so let, let me walk through this example one more time. You have a shelter, one big shelter, a mass shelter, 400 beds, averages around 3,000 3, people a year. You have a family shelter then that has like 50 beds, averages around 800 people a year. Shelter C is um, a victim service provider. It's a smaller 25-bed shelter. Obviously, this one is the largest, but it doesn't start until July 1st. These other uh, kind of family facilities started February 1. So the family shelter and the victim service provider shelter started February 1. So now what's your start date in here? Is it February 1? Is it July 1? How do you figure that out? So we, um, we do some math here. And we say that and this, this is not like we're not sending the rocket ship to Mars. We don't have to be precise here. We're um, getting estimates for how do you figure out the start date. So shelter A with the 3,000 clients divided by 12, that's about 250 people they serve a month. B serves about 67, C about 33. If we reported them the way they should be reported, the way when they start, when they each individually started, it's going to be 1,550 people that they collectively served. If you take these shelters and you start everybody on February 1st, which is the first day that you funded a shelter, you start everybody on February 1st then this mass shelter here all of a sudden is reporting 2,000 people, not 750 that they served, but 2,000. And shelter B and C serves, uh, uh, you know, it, it, they're coming in right. If you flip it the other way and start at July 1st, then we're back to the mass shelter only showing 750 and these other shelters being slightly deflated. So the end result is that there's 1,050 um, people if you start July 1st. We want you to hit the closest to 1550 without going over. That's kind of the rule. So hit as close as you can to what, what really happened without going over. We are trying very hard not to have overcounts. And we know there are overcounts because this, the city and the state will fund the same shelter. So we already know there are intrinsic overcounts in this. And we're trying very hard to reduce those uh, to the extent possible. And this is how we're doing it. I hope that helps. So there's one, more piece of, there's one more piece that's just a good reminder. It actually touches a little bit on Danielle's question uh, in the chat. And it's just a reminder that um, your rapid rehousing and your homeless prevention project should be new projects for ESGCV. They should be brand new. So you don't ever have report date issues with those as long as the report date is on the same date that those started or earlier because uh, – to bundle all of those rapid rehousing projects, if there was no one in them, say January 21st, and you didn't start serving until September 1st, you're not actually going to pick anyone up, right? Because no one's in those projects. So you'll get a whole big count of zero until, until it hits somebody, right, on that September 1 date. So it actually, we tend to share that uh, framing with regard to emergency shelter and street outreach because we know a lot of you are putting your money into those existing ones, ones you're already funding with ESG or perhaps another funding source. 
And so, and we're not telling you that that has to be set up separate. That would just be a very onerous uh, reporting requirement for you. So we're just telling you, for those, you got to get the date right. You got to figure it out. They're going to drive your date for the most part, unless you were able to start a rapid rehousing or a homeless prevention project uh, before all of that, and then that comes into the mix as well. So just just wanted to make sure that uh, you have that reminder. You may want to talk to your HMIS leads. And just verify that they're setting up those projects, the homeless prevention and rapid rehousing project as new projects, because that's going to be something that's really important for your reporting. And I think just to continue that just a little bit further to address Danielle's question, there's only one report start date. So you may have other projects that start later, what we call our late starters um, in subsequent quarters, but that's not going to change your report start date. There is one and only one report start date. Okay. Um, just another question on that same topic though. Can the report start date be a day other than the first of a month? In our case, shelter A began serving clients on August 3rd, shelter B August 28th, and after doing the math, um, a project start date of 828 actually gets us closest to a real number of being served. So should our start date be August 28th or does it need to be September 1st to catch all that? <laughs> I did and we've actually um, fixed Sage so that you can put in an actual date because so many of you um, wanted that real date. As you go forward, we're going to start the bundles always on the first of the month, but for this um, reporting start date for this first one, where you you can pick your date. Okay. Um, what are the ex what are the expenditure categories that are different from the caper? The unique activities. So, and some of those are actually in expenditure categories in um, in IDIS. Uh, William, you want to talk about that and I'll find the financial form for you? Yeah, that's probably going to be most helpful. So uh, just going through the ECCV notice, right, there are a couple extra things you're allowed to do, landlord's incentive, volunteer incentives. Uh, most of those costs fall under an existing category, right? You don't do landlord incentives on its own generally. It's tied to a funding type, right? So you do landlord incentives with respect to your rapid rehousing or with respect to homeless prevention. So you'll find that actually where you're going to be reporting that, it's going to be in those categories where you incur those expenses. So they won't have like a separate carve out. And you can see here, um, just looking at the homeless prevention piece that's, uh, that's on the screen, you'll have a landlord incentive. You have hazard pay, right? You, you're paying your staff who are providing homelessness prevention the additional hazard pay. Well, you would charge it under that appropriate cost. So there are very few things that will not fall under that. Uh, temporary emergency shelter actually looks um, a lot like normal shelter, but there are a few costs. We have a totally new temporary emergency shelter uh, piece to the financials. So that's good to take a peek at and understand what we're going to be asking you for that. We tried to mirror it as much as possible to normal shelter. But again, there are a few extra allowances, which is good, especially on things like uh, capital costs incurred. Uh, and then street outreach is going to be working a little bit overtime. Um, so we're, what doesn't fit in other categories is more or less going under street outreach. So, for example, and you can see it here, the hand washing stations. Uh, we're not making you collect data on every single person that puts their hand under their water fountain, right? Like, that just doesn't make any sense. You will have to report the financial data associated with hand washing stations under street outreach. You actually will not have to do a CSV upload for, for that. For normal street outreach, you will, just to be clear. But for hand washing stations, we're not making you do anything unique on the client level data collection. Again, it just is not realistic uh, based on how the service is used. So uh, if you have questions, the best place to go is actually to the expenditure form that Michelle has here. All of you have access to that, uh, but that'll give you a sense of the breakdowns. And we tried to tie it again as much as possible to an existing funding category. 
uh, follow up to that, how should projects differentiate, I think you just answered it really, but how do they differentiate between normal security deposits under the rule and landlord incentive security deposits for accounting and reporting purposes? So I think that's yep. on the screen where she's at, yeah. Yeah, so the difference here though, and maybe I'm reading too much into the question, but there is a local accountability piece as well. So we don't get into how you need to get this information from the stuff. We don't go there, right? But we expect you to go there. So you're going to have to set up your own um, collection requirements around finances uh, and just figure out what works best for you. Uh, this is an interesting one because security deposits, you don't report on that at all to us. Right? We don't get a security deposit line item within any of our component types. So you just, they just simply have to tell you they incurred it you know, in the appropriate place, right? Rapid rehousing or wherever it is. But for landlord incentives, you actually are going to have to report on that. So they're going to have to be able to tell you to the dollar and to the dollar tied to what? Rapid rehousing or homelessness prevention, how much they incurred for landlord incentives. So, again, we don't dictate how you do it. We do say that you do need to do it. Um, and you're going to need to move quickly on that. There, we know, based on some of the chat we've received in earlier sessions, that, uh, that you may not know what your subs have incurred to date. Well, we expect you to actually report what your subs have incurred to date. Um, so this is one of the reasons, you know, the report is due 30 days after October 1. It gives you some of that time to get that information. Um, recognize that's not easy, um, but we also like that, that part of it, that is part of the reporting requirements. So Danielle added some additional clarity to her original question, and it sounds like the issue is more about the fact that they won't have grant agreements executed for agencies that should be in their emergency shelter bundle by October 30th. Um, however, they will be by their second. It looks like uh, they were operating back in March of 2020, but they won't have executed agreements, so should they include them in their first reporting? And if not, then what? Yes, this is a great question, and this gets to the idea of, like, what's, what matters in terms of grant execution? Uh, because your states in particular, and this applies to cities, counties, but states in particular, you're giving grants out to other jurisdictions. So grants is this term that's, like, thrown all over the place. For the purposes of reporting here, we only care about our grants. We don't care about your grants. And I don't mean that to be rude, but it's more of like I want to be very, very clear. You're going to do what you do and how you track that money and how you get the money out. Most of you will do it through grants. What we care about is was funding spent on, uh, on an activity here that you will seek reimbursement on. Whether or not the grant's in place, whether, right, for your local grants. If you have an ESG grant, you have it signed, and you're allowing costs to be incurred on that, yes, we would tell you get that information on the expenditures incurred and the people you served. So, um, again, that's, I don't know how you want to do that. We know that not all of you will be able to do that. Uh, and you're going to ask for the ability to go back and report folks that you served previously when we do quarter two. Uh, I will say that that's going to be somewhat painful, but we know it's going to happen, right? We're aware of that. We just wouldn't recommend it because I feel like the quarterly reporting already has pain associated with it. Uh, that's going to be more pain, right? Like, because it requires um, extra layers that we're going to have to have to do to, to get it there. And that's uh, when I say we, I mean it's on both sides, right? For you as a recipient and us on the HUD side. So we want to avoid as much pain as possible. So try to get as much of that as you can in your first quarter. Uh, but we will work with you to make sure your reporting uh, is accurate in future rounds if needs be. Okay. Uh, Christina says, our ESG CV grant agreements are executed and are retroactive to March 1. We've completed advance, advances to subrecipients so far. So one, do advances function the same way as expenditures under this process? That's a great question. I don't know uh, because it depends a little bit on how you operate under that. We think of it as uh, actual expenses, so advances probably normally wouldn't be incurred because you can't tie it to a client, right? For the most part, I think of we get expenditure data and we get client data, and we want to pair the two together. So you say you serve 10 people and you say you spent a million dollars. I want to associate the 10 people and the million dollars. If you include all the advanced information but there are no people, you could be saying I served 
uh, I serve 10 people with a million dollars, but really that million dollars is going to serve a thousand people. And so it, it doesn't get to the right thing. So we would say, um, or my take on that is at least go with uh, expenditures as they're incurred, not the full advance amount. So her second part of that question, if funds have only been um, expended or expensed slash advanced under one component, i.e. emergency shelter, do we need to enter all subrecipients in this first report or only emergency shelter? Mm, that's a great question. So I'm going to start with the answer, but I'll look to Meredith and Michelle to, uh, to put any extra details. The reality is you just need to have the things associated with this report. So if you have one sub that's gotten the money, it, that's really all you need to set up to fulfill the quarterly reporting. It may help you to set up the other pieces just as you get further down the road. But again, this is, you know, we're dealing with one thing at a time. So I would say you don't have to. I just think it will actually help you later down the road. Um, Michelle and Meredith, do you have more from a technical sense on that that I'm not thinking of? Yes, I honestly don't think you you want to only show on the first report the projects that are started because otherwise you're sending a request for bundles for projects that haven't started. So, yeah, you have a list of all the things that you started, but you don't want to put them in Sage until until you're ready to go with them. So, right now get in everything that you have have expenses for or have served clients on up to 930. Send it in and then go on to the next one. Um, and and hopefully this is going to stabilize after after a while. You're not going to be, you know, starting and stopping projects. We we also and I think it's really important for the states to hear, we also as William said, don't care about your contracts. We care about the projects you fund. So if you fund one shelter for the next two years, but you start and stop three different contracts with them, we're not going to stop and start the reporting. You're going to keep reporting on that as if it's one shelter all the way through, and that one shelter is the one shelter set up in HMIS. So for those of you who get hung up on the contract notion, your contracts, and, and it's only states that seem to have this problem because you're so big, but you got to like set aside the contract issue and come back to the service issue. And the rule for shelter service, remember, is one person was served, we're going to count the whole shelter until you tell us you're no longer expanding ESG CV money on them, then you can stop that shelter. So Danielle says, if we don't know who we're funding with ESG CV uh, funding yet, ES funding, and cannot make our bundle prior to October 30th, then we exclude them from our reporting? <laughs> nice try, but probably not. Um, William and I have spent a lot of time talking about how you're going to do this, and we can't tell you we have the magic solution for you yet. We actually would hope we didn't have to have it, but um, the answer from HUD is no, we have to bring them in, and so we're going to have to figure out how to do that. To the extent you can get them in before September 30th, it will make your life and our lives much easier if you could do that. Um, she says, how can we include them if we don't know who they are? I, I get it. I totally get where you are. I, I get it. <laughs> For projects that have not expended funds and served clients by September 30th, they will be excluded in the initial report and then included in the first or second report? Yes. That's correct. Yes.
that looks like all my questions um, that I've seen come in, but as soon as I say that, I will get 10 more. Um, so please keep them coming. We've still got 15 minutes. If you have more questions, um, happy to take them. Were you going to show something, Michelle, while we're waiting? I was hoping to bring up the start date for the second quarter so they could see how they do that, but Sage is we run a test system here, so if our programmers are on it at the same time I'm in it, it's going slow, and I'm sorry. Well, these are great questions. We'd love to see more. Again, our goal here is just to, we'll tell you the big points that we keep seeing come up, and we just want to be able to answer your questions. And we know, again, next week we have another set of office hours, uh, October 1, if I recall right. and. You might have a lot more questions as you're stuck in the middle of, of your report. So that's why we're doing this. Uh, and we're very, very happy to be able to do that. And AAQ is always available to you. Uh, so we're just trying to create a couple couple spaces for this. I should say, I'm surprised it hasn't come up yet. We do actually have some guidance, a guidance document that we are putting out with this. So you don't have to fully rely on this. Um, like many other things, it's not quite done yet. Uh, we had some hiccups after the notice came up, and then we're, we're dealing with a few extra things. So we will put it out. I can't promise it will be out by October 1. I can promise it won't be anything different than these, uh, the, what's shared in these sessions. Uh, but I'm really hoping that we get it out to you uh, at least by then, and you have until the 30th to complete your reporting. So just want to put that out there. Again, it hasn't been happening. I'm a little surprised it hasn't. So we were really scared that was going to happen, and so we wrote some instructions for you on every page. So if you can please to, uh, follow the instructions on every page, that's not common in SAGE or any other system, but we were just really afraid how this stuff was going to go. And so there are really entry data entry instructions on each page. Amy, can you clarify what reporting timeline grid you're referring to? I'm not sure I know what that is. Um, but I do have another question that came in about expenditures. Are expenditures only counted for this process when we as a state request reimbursement for them? Nope. The expenditures, you report expenditures as they're incurred. So it's not about when you reimburse for them as a state. Uh, you should be contacting your sub coming into a reporting period uh, and asking them. So my recommendation is you set up all your uh, or contact them, figure out if expenses are, are incurred so you know what projects to include in a bundle. They may not know right away or be able to tell you right away. Get the bundle set up so you have a whole, like, let's get the HMIS leads what they need to for the project reporting or the client reporting. That also buys you some time to concurrently work with your subs to get data on the finances. So you may end up using two or three weeks to, uh, to gather all that information from your subs so that you can report it here. Thanks. Michelle, can you go to your slides? Um, I don't remember if it was the last session, but you had that table that had all of the quarter end dates and then all of the due dates. I think that's what Amy is referring to. Um, okay, so another question while she's pulling that up. Um, so the reporting start date will be the same for every sub. However, does that mean that each bundle will have a different start date or each bundle will still have the same start date? Each, but everybody will have the same reporting start date. Once you start, everybody, that's the date. Unless they're a late starting program, then, then they will have a separate start date. Thank you. Okay, another one, if we want to give hazard pay to temporary emergency shelter funded staff or volunteer incentives to temporary emergency shelter volunteers, will we have to record that under emergency shelter? 
So costs incurred for the temporary emergency shelter should be reported under the temporary emergency shelter. And maybe the question's coming, maybe the screen still needs to be updated um, to reflect that those costs are eligible there. I'm, um, we might want to peek at that, Michelle, to see if those are eligible costs under temporary emergency shelter. But they will be eligible. Uh, so if they didn't reflect there, we'll update the temporary emergency shelter screen to, uh, to ensure that they are there. The unique activity costs? Yeah. I, I have them in the mock-up we have in the guidebook, so I think. I think they should be there. Okay. There you go. Thanks, Michelle. Yep, so the reporting period always starts on the first day of the quarter. So it's funny because this says start September 30th, um, but really it's actually starting October 1st and we'll go through the 30 days. So it will go through uh, October 30th. So really the, the next one will start January 1 and will conclude January 30th. That will be your reporting timeline. Um, but you'll be reporting on the data uh, in the previous quarter, ending the date before that, right? In the, all efforts ending September 30th you'll report on in this October 1, October 30 timeline. So it's all expenses that would have been incurred between October and December have to be reported by January 30th. Yep. Okay, so this question is, I know that shelter has the same projects in HMIS regardless of funding source, but rapid rehousing and prevention are separate projects dependent on funding source. Should there be a separate street outreach project in HMIS for ESG and ESG CD? So that's up to you, right? If you're more or less continuing from an existing project, you have the choice to just uh, keep the existing project set up. Or if it's easier for you, you can set up a new project. We have found that it, that often is not the easier route to go, right? Because you have an existing project. You're, you're incurring costs the way you know how. You just need to now add more data because you're serving more people. Um, or you, maybe you're just adding other costs, like hazard pay. You're actually not serving a lot more people, but you're incurring different costs. There we'd say you don't need a new project set up. However, for local purposes, you may need it, right? The way you respond to your mayor or your county supervisors, that actually may make sense for you to do a new project set up because of how you're reporting to them. That's why I doesn't want to dictate to you which one you have to do, uh, because there may be local reasons for you to set up your projects a certain way, but we would say you have that option. You can choose what means what makes the most sense to you in that scenario. Probably the most flexible of the project setup rules in HMIS is around um, street outreach, because the um, the difficulty of collecting any data doing street outreach is really tough. So we try to. Um, be as flexible as possible with even um, how many funding sources are in one project. Okay, we've got one here that says, part of our response to COVID-19 was funding wellness shelters. We funded three in the spring and they're now closed. It is our intent to submit a reimbursement request for those costs to FEMA. We've um, been working with FEMA on several requests. It's not yet been submitted. The FEMA process is, long, is lengthy. If FEMA rejects our reimbursement requests for these shelters, we'll, um, we'll fund them with ESG CV. So it's extremely likely that the eventual funding source will be unknown in October. How should we address this in our SAGE quarterly report? Well, that's a fun one. So, uh, if you don't know, you, you really can't report it as ESGCB. I mean, that's just the reality. There's nothing to report there. And so you just can't include it. And you're going to have to go back and we'll have to go through that painful process if you end up needing to fund it through ESGCB of how do I go back and ensure that's put in. So that, that won't be fun in reality, but yeah, you really, you just can't report it here. You just don't know that you're going to incur ESGCB costs on that one. Um, yeah. Bear in mind, though, that 60-day allowance that we talked about early on in the call, uh, it's possible you actually don't have to 
collected data on it if it was only open for 60 days in that early part of the year. So you may have a pass in terms of ESGCB uh, client reporting, which may be nice for you in this case. Uh, so just keep an eye on the dates that it was open uh, if you're going to use it there and, and look for our guidance on what counts as temporary emergency shelter. Because uh, not, not everything counts under temporary emergency shelter. There are some limits to it. Uh, it's very flexible, but, but it, doesn't, it doesn't allow for everything. So this sounds like it probably is okay. Um, but I would send an aid to you to be safe once you have uh, an answer one way or the other for, about FEMA. Okay. Uh, William, this one I'm going to direct to you to decide if you want to answer it or not. Um, this community designated funds to the emergency shelter component in their substantial amendment. If they now want to change that to have it go to temporary emergency shelter, do they have to update through another amendment process? So uh, I would say send an AQ. My, my kind of first response to that is it depends a little bit how you set it up. Uh, we, we don't want to make the substantial amendments be so terribly specific that it, like every change you make, you have to go back to your substantial amendment. Uh, and one example is this, what did you say about shelter? If your language is broad about uh, providing a crisis response through emergency shelter, and you may not have mentioned temporary emergency shelter, but you mentioned a large uh, crisis response through emergency shelter in response to COVID, you're probably okay, actually. This is the type of thing where we don't, again, we don't want to kill you with, like, small nitpicky things. That, that's just not a useful thing for any of us. But I would send uh, an AQ, and in the AQ, it would be helpful to know what language you use about emergency shelter so that we can say, yeah, that's broad enough and you don't really have to do anything or you painted yourself in a corner and you're going to have to do something new. Okay. Those are all the questions I see so far. Um, if anyone has anything else you want to get in, we have about four minutes left. Okay, can reports be revised if the information submitted by the deadline was not accurate? So I'm hesitating here because this is as much a technical question as anything else. Um, I, I guess we don't have that in mind right now, but it's not that different from the question of what if I funded something and I didn't know I was funding it, right? Like the FEMA, FEMA question. That's, at the end of the day, that's like the same concept. You're saying, well, I'm, I didn't know I funded it, so I need to go change my data because it's, it's there, and we're going to make a workaround for that. Um, so I imagine at the end of the day that same workaround will, will work in this case. Uh, it's, again, not something I would recommend for lots of reasons. We will be reporting this, and Congress is really excited about this. So I, I will say that there comes a point where the public accountability is they may, uh, some of our uh, elected officials come back to their communities and say, hey, HUD told us that you spent this. Uh, so, so just be aware that there's a lot of like a ripple effect on something like that. So just, but you may not have control and that's just the way it is. So if I could, if I could just follow on that as the person that sends all of your ESG CV or ESG reports back when you ask for them back, if HUD has started reviewing an, an APR ESG report and has gone through the process, then it is very difficult for us to send it back because they have gone through all of the process of validating it and saying it's okay. And once we pull it back, they have to do that all over again. So. In general, the field offices do not want it to be returned. They want it right the first time if you can possibly do that. If you can't and you find that a, a provider is off by one or two people, in the big scope of things, that doesn't matter. Let it go. Um, and, and when we send these back and, and we find out that it's like two or three people that were changed, it's like don't think of this nationally, not locally for your one project. If they're one or two people off, everybody's going to survive with this. 
Okay, I'm going to finish this up with, I think, this last question here. Is there a possibility of looking at a 45-day due date rather than 30 days? <laughs> yeah, you got 30. You were going to get 10. <laughs> you... <laughs> Every time you find a mistake in our stuff that goes back to three days or one day or ten days, it's because you, for a long time, you were going to get ten. <laughs> Not to say we won't uh, pay thought about that. I just, uh, yeah, to get 30 days was a stretch. Uh, like, we know the realities of serving people. Doing an annual caper is a lot of work. So doing a quarterly report, and we went through this with HCRP. That was not a fun process. Uh, we know it. We are totally with you. Um, and, again, we almost lost the argument about 30 days. We almost had a 10-day reporting timeline. So uh, we may not fight too much on this because what we don't want to happen is somebody to say, oh, you got 30 days? No, 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 you got to be back in 10 days. So that, that would be the worst result for everyone. So we'll, uh, but, but for those of us who, uh, who can figure out if there's a way to push that a little more, we will uh, we'll talk internally. Just don't hold your breath. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, I think um, it is 4 o'clock. So with that, I think we have finished today's session. Um, thanks, everyone, uh, for joining. Thank you.